Okay. So thanks everyone and thanks for the invitation, uh, Max and, and Darren. So my name is Fred Cuyer. I'm working for uh, Cisco in the services organization. I'm taking care of a service provider uh, and I'm working with them on uh, the different phases of their project. All of them actually, whether it's design, support, uh, testing, uh, deployment, optimization, etc. And today, for my uh, for my first talk on uh, virtual log, I wanted to share with you my experience uh, on a project I had the opportunity to work on a few years ago. Uh, about uh, a large-scale service provider interconnection and and major, uh, so so that was a few years ago. But still, I think it's still uh, interesting to to share some uh, some experience and, and lessons learned about uh, about this uh, specific topic. Uh, the reason why I, I chose this uh, this topic uh, is the following: um, the market the market uh, the SP market is very active at the moment. We can see. Uh, many uh, merges uh, between service provider, uh, so it's definitely uh, active. And there are some big merges, some some small merges, but at the end, uh, the content of this presentation should apply to, to most of them. There are also the other reason I wanted also to make this uh, to make this talk is uh, when I prepared this project, I found very few OSPF to ISIS uh, migrations documented online as part of my research. There was one uh, about uh, AOL so that was a long time ago for Nanoc29. Uh, that was a useful resource, but I wanted to add my own uh, contribution. The other reason I wanted to talk about uh, this one uh, is uh, this project uh, has, non, has not been uh, performed a few years ago, so it's not, uh, it's not private anymore. So unfortunately, I cannot disclose my, my customer name because uh, I owe them some, some privacy. So we'll call them SP1 and SP2, but let's consider this experience uh, semi-public and it's big enough to, to care. So you will see uh, the scales, the scale we are talking about, but I think it's big enough to, to mention it on, uh, on the NOG talk. Last but not least, that's my first ever NOG talk on virtual NOG, my first ever BB, B conference as well. Uh, so for this first talk, I wanted to, to come back to the, to the fundamentals and back to the networking routes. Uh, let's talk MPLS routing, no 5G, no SDN, no AI stuff, uh, very, uh, very basic uh, networking. So the agenda for today is the following. Uh, first, I will present you uh, the context and the environment uh, I worked on. For, for those two customers. And then we will cover the different phases of this project. There have been a few of them. Then I will discuss about work that is still in progress because uh, there's still work to do uh, in networking. And, uh, and then I will, uh, I, will, I will finish with some uh, additional and ad hoc topics you need to address when you want to merge networks. It's not all about networking as you will, uh, as you will see. So the high environment uh, I worked on. So SP1 and SP2 are a service provider. Uh, both of them are nationwide networks. They are presented in the same country. SP1 has been acquired by SP2. Uh, that was a few years ago. And, uh, and as part of this acquisition, of course, uh, the owners and the shareholders, they want to consolidate the networks. So this presentation will be about the B2B uh, interconnection. There, there, there is, uh, there are other networks, especially for for SP1, as you can see, but we will only talk about uh, B2B in this presentation. So uh, both networks had uh, different IGPs. So SP1 run uh, ISIS, SP2 runs uh, OSPF. Both networks are multi-vendors. So we can find, uh, let's say, the most common vendors in the in the industry. I think now there is some Huawei as well. I did not mention it, but Huawei is also present. Both networks have legacy. So with the legacy, uh, I mean very old uh, devices. The scale is big, big, let's say. Uh, it all depends on the reference that, that you have and the environment you are used to work on. But 500 nodes uh, starts to be a big network to me. So both of them were uh, almost the same size. And in terms uh, of services, uh, SP1 uh, still offering uh, quadruple play services, so uh, mobile, triple play, so IPTV, internet, uh, voice over IP, and also B2B services. 
they used to have a dedicated backbone for that, for B2B services and dedicated core. SP2, it's a different story. So they had a converge core already and dedicated PEs. So the PE is dedicated for, for B2B services and PE is dedicated for, for B2C services, Juniper ones. Let's discuss about the, the timeline. So as you can see, uh, we were not very fast. <laughs> but the good news is uh, the, the speed can be improved, definitely, because we didn't identify any technical showstopper along this, uh, this journey. So, so once you, the acquisition starts, uh, you, cannot, you cannot start uh, as soon as possible because there are still some discussion with the regulatory authorities, etc. Um, so yeah, this took quite a lot of time, uh, but still, yeah, it can be can be faster. I think realistically, this whole project can be done under uh, one year if you have a, if you have a dedicated and focused team can be done under under one year. So the, the interconnection uh, part uh, was was pretty pretty fast actually. We will describe it uh, just uh, just and then we had a long pause uh, before before performing the, the rolling out of the of the migration and especially the, the IGP merge. But once it was started uh, it went pretty pretty fast. So the first phase of this project was the engineering uh, part. Uh, I call that the study part. Uh, we had to pick up the InterS option that we will uh, implement. So we went for uh, InterS uh, option C for, for different reasons. Option A uh, could not scale due to the, to the scale and the number of customers uh, SP1 and SP2 had. Uh, we are talking about uh, 100, uh, 100 of case of, of, of subscribers, 300 case subscribers, so that's, that's a lot. Uh, option B, we were against this option because we didn't want to introduce VPN v4 and VPN v6 address families on ASBR. We wanted to keep them only for, for transport. So we went for option C, which is quite common in this kind of, uh, of mergers. SP1 and SP2 had different IGPs, so we had to pick up one ultimately. Uh, I will not go over the OSPF versus ISIS battle. Uh, you will find some, some, some slides uh, in the annex of the presentation that covers some difference uh, or not between the two protocols. We also had to uh, evaluate the target scale, both for IGP and BGP, and especially to know if if, if the two networks will, will work with the with the target scale, uh, and especially for, for the legacy part, where we were quite afraid of the legacy. Obviously, we had to check uh, the lookbacks were not uh, overlapping because the lookbacks are carrying the, the services ultimately, so luckily, uh, they, they were not. So both SP1 and SP2 were using private IP ranges, but luckily we didn't have any IP overlap. So we didn't have to deal with a IP readdressing plan. If you have to do that, that will take a lot of time. And that's, that's a different story. Before uh, performing any change in, in changes in production and before documenting them, actually, we did a quick uh, POC with a virtual lab. So we used some virtual machine and built uh, a replica, a small replica of SP1 and SP2 just to validate our, our scenario. So the interconnection and then the, the, the migration part. Once that was done, we were able to create the documentation associated to this project, the high level design, the low level design, and uh, the, migration, uh, the migration plan. So let's discuss now about the first phase, which is uh, the interconnection part. That was the first thing we did for, for this project. So this is very classic stuff. Uh, we are talking about MPLS interest option C. So we had four touch points, four ASBR spread all over the country, actually in the, in the, four, in the four directions uh, to have balanced traffic between, between two networks. We had to implement a BGP label unicast for the transport between the ASBR, so that's uh, RSC 3107, so external flavor. We had to redistribute uh, lookbacks uh, from IGP to BGP and then from BGP to, to IGPs uh, to get end-to-end -end LSP 
uh, to be able to have the transport end to end uh, between the PEs. And then from the for the services part, we had to interconnect uh, the PNV4 and the PNV6 route reflector with MP EBGP multi app uh, sessions. Very very classic uh, classic design. So the goal was to provide services across the two networks as soon as possible. So SP2 had, had a better coverage uh, compared to SP1. Uh, they had they had more PEs, or let's say the design was different. So so they had an advantage. So they wanted to to take advantage of this uh, network capillarity to to deploy services very quickly between the two different uh, service providers. So the, for the transport, as I said, BGP label unicast flavor, everything very classic. You need to pay attention to the label allocation and you want to control that, I believe. You can allocate a label uh, for every single prefixes you will redistribute into your BGP, but, but better control them with, uh, with a road policy, really, just to, to make sure everything will go, will go fine. Same for uh, MPLS LDP label allocation. So make sure that you want to filter that. You have the easy option to just allocate uh, LDP label for every single loopback or, or slash 32 routes. Or you can also control that with an access list, which I, which I recommend. We had to redistribute BGP to IGP because the PEs we are not supporting or not all PEs, we are not supporting IBGP label unicast uh, flavor uh, due to, to legacy. So, so we had to deal with mutual redistribution, which is always tricky. We use the well-known tricks, uh, setting some, some tags on IGPs. So both OSPF and ISES supports tags. So remember the tricks, you say you are setting tags in one direction and then for the, for the other redistribution, you are denying the tag uh, you put just before. For the route reflector, very classic stuff as well, as I said, MP, BGP, multi-op uh, configuration, and just need, uh, just remember that you need to implement this uh, configuration, BGP next stop and change, so that the, the, the BGP next stop are propagated uh, between SP1 and SP2, and SP1 is seeing SP2 lookbacks as BGP, BGP next stop. So very, very, very classic. Things to know, so uh, when we did this, this first uh, interconnection, uh, we found some, some issues uh, that, that, that didn't go as, as planned, uh, and especially on SP1 side. So I was engaged on SP2 side, and SP1 side, the SBR were Nokia. And on Nokia, uh, you had to make sure that you don't forget to, to implement uh, a configuration which is called Export Tunnel Table Policy. Actually, it's mentioned into their documentation. That, that configuration is present to stitch LDP to BGP label unicast. And if you if you don't have it, the LSP will be broken. And this is what happened during the first try when we tried to, to interconnect the networks uh, first. Uh, unfortunately, that was missed into our CPOC and virtual lab because at the time we didn't have Nokia virtual machines available to perform this kind of test. So that was, uh, that was missed. Then let's discuss about uh, OSPF to ISIS uh, migration part. So that was phase phase two. Uh, we started with uh, the engineering and the did phase. So as I said, uh, OSPF was present in SP2, ISIS was present in SP1, and we had to choose one. So ISIS was picked up for several reasons. I will go very quickly. First, it supports IPv6 natively, uh, so you don't have to add a new uh, routing protocol into your, your network, like OSPF v3, for example. Also, what we found and what was verified uh, is that uh, segment routing features are shipped faster into ISIS, and that's because most SPs use ISIS, and that's been verified over, over the years and still true today. Uh, last but not least, SP1, they, they had and they still have uh, B2C backbone, which is already using uh, ISIS. So we wanted to have at the end one single IGP or one protocol, if you want, uh, 
used everywhere. That's 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 better for for operations. That that makes them life uh, easier. Regarding the design, so as I told you, SP1 had 500 nodes. SP2 they have uh, 500 as well. Is it a good idea to run a flat ISIS L2 domain with uh, 1,000 nodes? Maybe not, but ultimately that was customer decision for, for several reasons. The first one is their physical design didn't allow, uh, let's say, to build a, a good uh, logical hierarchical design. So that was the first one. And I think the main reason was it's just faster and easier to, to deploy everything into uh, a flat L2, L2 domain. So, so they went for, for this, uh, this option. We worked on a backup scenario for the legacy because, as I said, we were very concerned that the legacy could not support the target scale. So we worked on a backup design that, that was not used at the end to isolate uh, legacy PEs in their dedicated L1. But we didn't have to, to use it. As I said, we were very concerned about the, the legacy and the scale, so we spent quite a lot of time to validate that into the, into the lab and into the validation uh, phase. So we spent, I believe, maybe one month in the lab. So this time we used a physical lab with uh, real hardware with all the vendors that uh, were present in those two networks. I think we had around 50 test cases and we were covering almost everything. Interoperability, scaling, migration, high availability, etc., etc. Conversion testing as well. Obviously, we also tested the migration scenario at this time uh, with real hardware, and uh, and that gave us some confidence to to move forward for the for the production. Some lessons learned about this uh, this validation, which was very uh, very useful. The first one is we found some some problem on Redback. Maybe it's been fixed since, but eventually we didn't deploy MPLS and DP Sync uh, on those platforms because it was was not working. Maybe there was a bug. The other big surprise for us was the legacy. So we were very afraid that the 7200 Cisco and the Redback uh, SE100 will not scale because those were very old device with very small CPU, very small amount of memory. So we spent a lot of time to test the scale uh, on those ones. So with a traffic generator, we were able to inject a lot of prefixes. We were able also to inject some churn over 24 hours just to see how the routers were, were behaving. And at the end, it just worked really. It worked quite fine. So we doubled the, the scale in the lab uh, to have some, some room for mirrors. But ultimately, we were very confident that would work because uh, nothing happened. No crash, no memory leaks. Everything was, was running fine. So very big surprise for us with, uh, with such scale on this uh, very whole platform. So now I will cover the uh, deployments. So we were using OSPF. We had to deploy ISIS. So we used what we call the, the ships in the night technique. So it's all about deploying the target and the new uh, IGP uh, in the network, but with a higher administrative distance. So it's a gradual deployment. OSPF is still driving. OSPF is still the, um, let's say, the still controlling the rib and, and so the forwarding plan. So it's just uh, about deploying ISIS in parallel, but ISIS will not, will not be used uh, at all. Once as ISIS is deployed, we can uh, check uh, the databases to make sure that uh, it's similar to the SPF one. We can also check the SPF log to make sure that there is no routing loops or instability, etc. And then we can start the, the migration. So the migration is the same thing. Uh, we just need to play with the administrative distance. So we are switching ADs uh, on OSPF and on ISIS to make ISIS uh, the preferred protocol. So that doesn't change anything uh, on the forwarding plan because we use the same metrics, etc. So no, no impact uh, observed during this uh, during this uh, deployment and during this uh, this switch. We decided to start from the edges and then uh, come back to the to the core, uh, and eventually 
on 500 nodes with a bit of both man automation that was handled by the, by the customer with some, let's say, low cost expect uh, scripting uh, at the time. We were able to, to swap uh, OSPF by ISIS into SP2. So that was a, a big, uh, big milestone uh, already. Uh, of course, uh, for the ASBR, we had to change the mutual distribution, so make sure that we are distributing BGP into ISIS instead of uh, instead of OSPF. And voila! And then at the end, it just uh, it just worked. It's it's really not so not so difficult. Uh, just need to to make sure that you test everything in the lab to gain the confidence. And once you are ready, you can just follow follow your plan. Some lessons learned about uh, this migration, not so many uh, really, because uh, it worked just as expected. Uh, the tricky part was uh, the management part because SP2, they don't have any dedicated out of band management network. So the routers were reachable for their uh, transport lookbacks. And, and, and so we were literally uh, swapping the engine uh, when, when in flight, so so we were afraid of losing access of the routers, but uh, it never happened. It, it just worked. So on this one, no no lessons learned. Really, uh, it just it just worked. Phase three was uh, was a big one. Really, uh, that was the one everybody was afraid of the customer and this maintenance window we did that uh, during summer time where everybody was uh, on pto uh, and only a few number of engineers were available about what will uh, uh, what will happen during this maintenance window so we call that the igp merge uh, but everybody was uh, was really afraid uh, of yeah basically breaking everything on sp1 and sp2 so this is how we how we did that. So the first thing we did is we wanted to control the propagation of ISIS flooding and events between the two different networks. So we decided to shut down three SBR out of four just to control things, just to make sure uh, everybody, uh, all the traffic goes through the same interface, all the signalization goes through the same routers, and we don't have to troubleshoot some routing loops or, or things like that. So we were able to control things uh, with only one interconnection remaining. So that was the first thing we decided to do. And when we do, when we did that, obviously we did that during uh, during nights, and uh, and we had enough capacity to 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 pass all the traffic uh, on one ASBR. The second thing we did is we raised the administrative distance. So again, we played with uh, with the trick for BGP label unicast, and we wanted to to make it higher than ISIS. To be able to apply this change, uh, at least on Cisco, we had to clear the route so that the, the rib was correctly applying the good uh, the good distance. We tested some some different scenarios for this one. Uh, basically, it was just about de deploying ISIS and and getting rid of of BGP label unicast, and and really that was uh, the best scenario. Uh, with this technique, we had less than one second of impact on the traffic, uh, and even less. So, so that was a uh, it's a good a good investment in the lab to test different scenario. So this is what we used. And then once uh, the AD was changed for, for BGP label unicast, we just configured ISIS and LDP on the ASBR interconnection. And uh, once the ISIS adjacencies came up, all the traffic started to use ISIS and LDP uh, programming because ISIS ADs was, was smaller than BGP label unicast. Natively, everything uh, moved from BGP to ISIS slash slash LDP. So nothing happened. <laughs> Literally, we were very afraid that we we encountered some, some big problems, but ultimately it just worked again. So before deploying those changes across the remaining ASBR, we spent one hour, let's say, to, to test everything, to validate the transports, validate the services, uh, discuss with the NOC to, to be sure that everything was okay. We were also monitoring the, the IGP churn, the SPF logs uh, everywhere to make sure that we didn't have any routing loops or we didn't miss anything. Uh, but everything was, was okay, ultimately. Uh, 
then we continued the, um, the plan. So the plan was to deploy SIS and LDP on the three remaining interconnections. Uh, again, we perform a full sanity check to be sure and to be really, really, really sure that everything was working fine. And uh, we didn't cause any any damages on the network. Uh, everybody was expecting a network meltdown, uh, actually two, an SP1, one on SP1, one on SP2, and it just worked. So so we followed uh, the IOL guys' uh, plan until the end. Uh, and after this big uh, maintenance window, we enjoy some very well-deserved uh, peers with my, with my colleagues and the customer. So this is the final picture. So, so at the end now, we have one single IGP covering both SP1 and SP2. We still have the MP EBGP multi obsession between the route prefectors. Uh, I will not spend a lot of time to cover the, the services part. I will talk a bit uh, at the end. Uh, you will see what we will do with, uh, with them. So we now have a 1,000 node uh, IGP uh, network and uh, an emerge B2B, B2B backbone. I told you everything worked as expected, but uh, of course we had some, some problem, but very small problem. Um, when we did and when we deploy ISIS and the ASBR, uh, that had a consequence on the route reflectors, uh, and we triggered some BGP through peers for, for some uh, remote PEs that was that were very far. Uh, those PEs were located uh, uh, seven thousand kilometers far from uh, from France, and so they were connected with low bandwidth, uh, low delay, uh, high delay, sorry, and small NTU. So that triggered some BGP slow peer, because when we deployed ISIS, we also introduced some IGP change on the route reflector parts. And so they had to recalculate their, their best pass and to update everybody. And so that triggered some BGP slow speed. So we, we managed to mitigate this problem. Uh, first, down those, uh, those PEs, there were only four of them. And two, we decided to isolate them into dedicated static uh, slow peer groups. Other, all, except that, really, the, the deployment took less than 90 minutes, really. That was uh, very fast. And we kept BGP label unicast and OSPF configuration just in case we had to roll back the whole thing uh, during a few weeks. So, so yeah, that was, uh, let's say, security, and we still had our, our rollback plan ready uh, if things were, were going wrong. So I talk a lot about the B2B part. I also worked a bit on the B2C part uh, that was handled by customer, but we did provide some support uh, on that. Uh, and again, so that was all about using all the tricks available uh, that you have uh, with BGP. Uh, so local AS, AS override. One fancy thing they wanted to do, they wanted to advertise one look back from uh, SP2 through SP1 and SP1 had to send this look back back to SP2, so quite uh, quite dangerous. So we had to to break BGP anti loop mechanism. So don't try this at home. So on iOS XR by default, when the router is that a prefix contains a nice uh, in the AI pass that is one configured at the remote end it will not send uh, the BGP update. So you have, to, you have to disable that with the following command, yes, path, loop, checkout, disable. And of course, you have to make sure that the update, once it's sent from B2C1, it will be accepted on B2C2. So you have to configure a low IC uh, ingress. And again, yes, same, same acts that's been used for forever uh, for this kind of, uh, of project. So they are still work in progress. Um, so this project has been done a few years ago, but there are still things ongoing. Uh, actually, they were they are almost finished. And the first one is about uh, optimizing the, the routing between the two two networks. So this customer now has a, a merged B2B network, but this B2B network is also interconnected to a B2C one, which is uh, which is bigger. And so today this is done on 
on a large number of ASBR. So the, the first thing we want to do is to consolidate those number of ASBR because it doesn't make sense to have uh, 20 uh, touch points between those two networks. And the other uh, things we want to optimize is this uh, interconnection. So today, those two networks are interconnected with uh, a fake OSPF and LDP running only between OSBR and so using two mutual redistribution. So you see me coming, uh, ISIS redistributed into OSPF, OSPF is distributed into ISIS, ISIS is eventually redistributed uh, back into OSPF and OSPF back to ISIS. There are a lot of touch points. They have to maintain uh, prefix lists. They have to maintain a lot of stuff. And obviously that's causing a lot of uh, a lot of mess. So we want to get rid of that and we want to deploy BGP label unicast uh, between those two networks just to, to make sure that we leverage BGP features, better traffic engineering, uh, better scale, better stability. And we also want to improve the routing and make the routing optimal and symmetric because today we are losing some information about the IGP metrics between the two different networks because of this uh, intermediate to SPF IGP in the middle. So we want to deploy uh, AIGP, uh, accumulated IGP metric uh, with BGP label unicast to, to improve that. So the plan is to have this kind of, uh, of design that's, that's work in progress already. Uh, so BGP label unicast between B2B and B2C along with IGP metric. And with, this, with these features, uh, they will be able to have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a better routing between the, the two domains. On uh, B2C1, the plan is also to deploy IBGP label unicast. So we, we want to get rid of this uh, redistribution into IGP because the scale is very high. So ultimately, we want to move everything to, to BGP. And the good news is uh, you can combine uh, additional features with BGP, like uh, BGP additional pass with uh, with label unicast and IGP. So we discussed about MPLS, BGP, uh, redistribution, etc. So I told you in the, into the introduction that we'll talk about a lot about routing, classic stuff, but it's not all about uh, networking. And there are also things you need to consider when you are interconnecting new, uh, or when you are interconnecting and merging to service provider backbones. The first one, if it's not done already, uh, think about deploying IPv6. Maybe that's a good idea in 2021. And that will uh, especially address the case where you have IP overlap, and especially for, for management purposes. Uh, those customers, the NMS stations, they were using uh, IP ranges as well, and private IP ranges. And so that's a good opportunity to, to deploy IPv6 to avoid, uh, let's say, NMS overlap between the two different uh, networks. Uh, the second thing you need to pay attention to is quality of service. So SP1 and SP2, those were B2B providers, so they are offering SLA to the customers, but they don't necessarily have the same SLA, so they don't necessarily have the same quality of service policies, so you have to make sure that you align everything on a single policy because cost is ultimately working end to end. Uh, other topics like MTU, it, make, uh, it may, might be silly, but uh, when you are running different networks, you might use different MTU and at the end you also need to, to, pick, up, to pick up a single value. So SP1 and SP2 had different MTU, MTU values and there is also work in progress to to have the same MTU everywhere. This one is not an easy one. Huh? When you have legacy, uh, for example, some uh, very old routers, they don't support very big MTU. So it's not so it's not so easy to deal with. Other things, uh, administration plans. So how do you manage this new network? With which tool? Uh, do you need to update some SNMP communities, some, some access lists to reach the networks? Same thing for security. SP1 had some DDoS platform or DDoS mitigation platform. SP2 they didn't have, so they had also to to use some tricks to to leverage SP1 uh, anti DDoS uh, to benefit also SP2 customers. 
You also need to discuss with your transit uh, providers uh, because SP1 and SP2 we are using different uh, different transit providers. So ultimately, you don't want to spend a lot of money uh, with three or four different providers. So there is also consideration required for for this one. And then silly things like uh, how do you name the routers? How do you name the interfaces? How do you what software it is do you deploy on the on the greenfield routers? Uh, what is the vendor strategy? I told you that those customers they had everybody on board. At the end, you need to to choose one or two. Uh, so so those are also the kind of discussion required when you are merging a different large scale service provider networks. The BGP part, I told you, I will not cover it a lot because for this specific project, uh, we didn't take, uh, we we didn't manage that actually. So, so that's a huge effort for for B two B because those, those networks they have a lot of B two B customers. There are a lot of CPEs, and maybe the doesn't worth it actually. You do, you don't want to end reconfiguring uh, 150 k CPEs. Uh, just for the sake of changing the, the AS number. So, so ultimately, um, the legacy extinction and the migration will take care of uh, SP2 autonomous system extinction. Uh, on the internet border, it's easier because you have, uh, let's say, a few peers, few transit, few peerings, few uh, internet border routers. So that, that's easy. Uh, doing that for 100 k of subscribers on, on hundreds of these, that's, that's a very big effort. And ultimately, the customer was not uh, ready to, to engage into this, uh, this journey. And then nothing is easy, uh, or almost easy, let's say. Uh, but there are other aspects that you need also to take, uh, to take care of. Maybe it will not be the, the networking team, but uh, who is managing what, with, uh, with which tool, with which process, what kind of documentation do you use? Uh, you will have also to combine some engineering team, some NOx team, some support team, deployment team as well. Um, the biggest part and the hardest part for, for us, so luckily we were not involved into this one, uh, but that's the bidding part. So the OSS, BSS part, it's a nightmare really. And I think that was a, that, that's one of the, of the hardest topic you, you will have to deal with when you are merging two different enterprises. It's not even service provider, it's enterprises. And then and last but not least, don't forget uh, one plus one is never two uh, when you are doing acquisition and mergers. So, so, so some people and some team are, are redundant. Uh, so yeah, uh, not everybody is happy into this kind of, uh, of situation. And definitely you will find some, some pushback uh, from, from some teams. I told you that I did this migration a few years ago already, almost three or four years. Uh, so back in the time, uh, we used what was available. But it, if I had to do the same project in 2021, for sure, there are some things I would do differently. The first thing is I would deploy some, some telemetry to, to gain real-time visibility. We had some, some supervision, we had some check. I told you we spent a lot of time checking the transport, the services, etc. But it's just too long. So the SNMP resolution is about five minutes, sometimes 15 minutes. That's just too long to catch uh, something wrong in the network. So having telemetry would have helped uh, definitely. Rather uh, BMP for BGP telemetry or, or IGP telemetry with uh, BGP link state or even the, some Yang models available for the RIB. Oh yes, yes. I did uh, I did a, a work actually not so long time ago for for a customer. Uh, you will be able to see my my uh, my blog post on xrdocs.io about uh, about telemetry data plan and control plan. So I wish I had telemetry three years ago for for this one. The other part I wish I had is uh, IPSLA probes or tram probes to, to automatically test services and transport between SP1 and SP2. We did it, but we used some, some pings, etc. So that was very manual and low cost. So having IPSLA or tram probes, uh, that would be just make, make our life easier. More automation as well. So the customer for OSPF to ISIS deployment and migration, they use some expect scripting. 
Uh, but today I will, I will, I will not do that, of course. Uh, uh, SP1 and SP2 turns, uh, they have NSO deploy. So what I will do in 2021 is I would uh, deploy and I will build the NSO tool to model the existing uh, IGPs and have uh, two button migration uh, tools. So one for, for automatic IGP deployment and one for automatic IGP swap. That, that would be that would be easier to to do it. Same thing for ISIS database parsing and OSPF database parsing. So we did that, but it was all manual or semi-manual. And today I will uh, I will use a tool or some Python scripting magic to to automate that and make sure that nothing was missed during the deployment and the migration of the IGP. But overall, uh, even without all those tools, uh, this project and this uh, merger was uh, was a great success. So we didn't break uh, anything, and the customer was uh, was was very happy. So, so maybe SP1 and SP2 are currently attending this presentation. So if there are few engineers available, I'd like to thank them for for the trust they have uh, they have in us. So thanks for, for attending this one and uh, and I will be happy to answer some of the questions that you could have uh, before before starting my my beers <laughs> and and celebrating end of the week. Thank you.